welcome. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Come on in, find your seats. Come on, God has been doing some great things this week. He's going to continue the breakthrough this morning.
praise, oh God. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a mighty shout of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercies ever fail me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up. Sing that again to him. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. 
the earth with signs and wonders. Bring an awakening. Bring an awakening. Come and consume us with your power. Jesus, we need you in this hour. Bring an awakening. Bring an awakening. Come like the sound of roaring thunder. Cover the earth with signs and wonders. Bring an awakening. Bring an awakening. Come and consume us with your power. Jesus, we need you in this hour. Bring an awakening. Bring an awakening. We need an awakening. Yes. Oh, awaken us, Lord. Lift up your hands to him. Let's worship him this morning. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We want to take a moment now to invite you to belong because the belong journey is where you can find out more about becoming part of the Harvest Church family. And that class starts in just a few minutes. So if you're interested, you can grab your things out to the lobby, then down to the fellowship hall where that class will be taking place. Everybody else, you can greet somebody as you find your seats this morning. keeper in the house of the Lord than dwell at ease anywhere else. Amen. 
If you're new here to Harvest Church, we want to welcome you. We're so glad that you came to join us, and we would love if you would fill out our connection card. You'll find it in the back of the seat in front of you or in your bulletin, and if you fill it out, you can drop it in the offering bucket on your way out the door, or take it down to our coffee shop where they would love to give you a free drink of your choice this morning as a thank you for being here with us. So again, welcome. Our announcements this morning, the first being that this next Sunday and the one following, we will be having a bake sale that will benefit our Roar students mission trip to Mexico. So how many of you guys are excited for treats now after a week of prayer and fasting? So those will be available the next two weeks. Our new small groups are launching this week and you can sign up for all of the wonderful things that are being offered this term either on the app or online. So make sure to get signed up for those. Christianity 101 is launching February 5th. So the times will be the same for those of you that have been familiar with that class in the past. Saturday evening, 7.15, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. We are also adding Christianity 201. So requisite for that is to complete 101, and then 201 will be taking place Saturday evenings at 7.15 as well. It will launch, though, not until February 12th. So note those times. Our last announcement this morning is that our much-anticipated Harvest Crusade is on the calendar and taking place April 23rd and 24th. So there will be lots of information on that to come, but you can grab your bumper sticker out in the lobby on your way out the door. Join with me in prayer now as we pray over our tithes and offerings and the life-giving churches in our Treasure Valley. God, you're so good, and we're so thankful. Thank you that we can come in here this morning and praise your name together. God, we bring you our tithes and our offerings this morning with such joy and gladness. Thank you that you are our great provider. We turn to you, God, for every need of this house. And Lord, we ask you to bless the churches across the Treasure Valley, God, that glorify your name. And we pray specifically, God, for Capital Christian Center and Pastors Chris and Kelly. God, strengthen them, encourage them, raise up leaders about them, God. And we pray for healing in that house. Lord, continue to be in this service. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It is now my great pleasure to honor team leads in the house. Chris and Wendy, are you guys in here? There's Wendy. They are team leads over our service hosts. So they have taken on the care of the sanctuary and all the people in it. I'm sure you guys have been blessed by the people that open the doors, give us communion, take our tithes and offerings, help us find a seat. And that's just our regular Sunday service. So then all the special services, there's all the more for them to oversee. They also oversee our camp food and kitchen teams. Amen, right? I think what we should probably have up here is our um, camp videos <laughs> who let the cooks out if you don't serve anywhere they are an incredible team to get to serve under so Chris and Wendy thank you for loving us and for loving the Lord by serving as leaders in this house we're so grateful for you amen give him a hand and you can continue your hand and welcome Pastor Mark No, no, yeah, you, you keep that. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Bless you. Trying to help her down, and she thought I wanted the mic. But anyway, you always, as a man, you try to help ladies down the stairs, don't you? How many men are with me there? You open doors. I can remember I was, uh, I was in college when uh, I watched an older woman get in a car and drop a like a $20 bill on the ground when she got in or something like that value. I can't remember what it was. And I just walked over and just went, oh, here, you drop this and hand it to her and through the open door. And she said, well, chivalry isn't dead. <laughs> I had to go back and ask somebody what that meant. But here, the point is, you know, I, I always think it's funny when you open a door for a lady and she says, I don't need that. It's like, wow, well, be an ox if you want. If you're a woman, you'd appreciate it, you know. <laughs> So, <clears throat> hey, it's a great day to serve the Lord, and uh, I just want to tell you I'm excited about this year. It's the second Sunday of the year, and we're going to just sort of ex be expectant for what God wants to do. Uh, I love you, and we just had such a, a great week, and before we get into that great week and what we're going to do, I want to honor the greatest servant in the church that I know of, and that's my dear wife, Pastor Didi. Her birthday... <laughs> Her birthday is this week. She's going to be 45. And so we're going to sing happy birthday to her. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Didi. Happy birthday to you. Well, her birthday is on Wednesday this week, and uh, so if you want to give her a card or any kind of a thank you or gift or anything, why, you're, you're welcome to do that anytime between now and next Saturday because uh, we're leaving early next Sunday morning to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. That was, <clears throat> that was in November, but we planned a getaway for the end of January here. And so she's having a birthday, and we're leaving for the Gulf of Mexico, Florida coast just a few days later. So if you want to get her suntan lotion or sunglasses or beach shorts or something like that, Go ahead. Well, hey, thank you all for your love, and thank you for uh, pressing in and seeking God. We just had such a great time last week in fasting and prayer, our annual Seek God time. We did three days of water fast and Wednesday, uh, Thursday, Friday night prayer meetings and worship and word, and uh, it was just a great time. The presence of the Lord was just so rich. How many appreciated the presence of the Lord in the prayer meetings this last week? And the great word that came forward, we just were so blessed and edified. And I know many people had breakthrough and answers to prayer. Come on, what a mighty God we serve. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm starting a new series today, and it's called Servant of All. Servant of All. We'll be doing this series throughout the uh, month. And I just want to bring your attention to this fact. Jesus Christ came to the earth to fulfill a number of roles. He came as the Messiah. He came as the son of David. He came as the king of the Jews. Uh, he came of all these as the son of God. But of all of these, his role as the sacrificial servant was preeminent. It was his greatest calling. It was the foundation and underpinning for everything else that he did. In fact, the Bible tells us in Philippians 2 that he made himself of no reputation. He made himself. When's the last time that we as Christians sought to have no reputation? I mean, just think about what it says. Kind of amazing, huh? He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bond servant, an indentured servant, a servant that's committed, has a contract, has to show up, doesn't have the option of taking a day off. He's a servant. He's there. He's faithful. He does what the master asks. He came as a bond servant. And then it says, he came as a bond servant in the form or in the likeness of men. Jesus decided as the Son of God to come out of heaven to earth for the purpose of the Father and the salvation of the world. And in order to save you, he decided to become like you. But what he called you was a servant. The form of man, mankind, was made to serve the Lord. Mankind was made to serve. I was born in his likeness, created in his image. I was born to serve the Lord. And so Jesus came proving by his servanthood that, and being made in our image that we are the best creature that God has ever made to serve him with. We can serve him better than birds and flowers and trees and ocean and fish and anything. We can serve him better than bears and elk and deer. And we, we're mankind. We're higher than creation, the, the, the natural creation. We're made in the image of God, and he came in the form of us. What a miracle. Maybe God made us in his image way back then in the beginning so he could send his son in our form so his son could serve the purpose of redemption and become the savior of the world. What an awesome God we serve. 
Let me do a, two quick, uh, a quick two-question test for you. I'm just asking you true or false. Everybody ready? All right. First question, true or false. Is mankind or is humankind or how, let me say it this way. Are human beings self-centered? How many say true? How many say false? Okay. Second question. By the way, there were no takers on false. We've all voted that human beings are self-centered. Second question, are you a human being? I take the chuckle was affirmative. Okay, we're all human beings. Human beings are self-centered. I realize that's a little bit of a uh, kind of a catch uh, test, but... What I'm trying to just demonstrate to you is we'll all admit that other people are selfish. We seldom will admit that we are. But we live in a meism culture. The first word every child learns is I. They learn to say it before they can talk. You know how? They cry whenever I want something. They cry when they're hungry. They cry when they're awakened in the crib. They cry when they are mad. They cry when they want hell. They, they learn that the cry services I. And we never forget it. <laughs> Complain. Squeaky wheel gets the, the you know, the, the, the oil. So anyway, we all have that thing deep inside. Everybody go like this with your hands. Now, close your palm. Which way did your fingers go? <laughs> right towards you, right? You're made to grab, to hold, to pull. Hands were made to bring things to you. You pick things up, you feed yourself. Hands are made for you. No hands, hard to eat. No hands, hard to dress. Hands were made to serve you. But they really were made to serve others. Yeah. Yeah. Serving you is just practice to get ready to serve others. So, you know, we play King of the Mountain. It's common kids game when we're little. We live in the me-ism culture or the kingdom of self. What are some synonyms for selfishness? Everybody know what selfishness is, right? Everybody know what it is when somebody's just selfish and we all have selfish tendencies. We can sort of look out for number one when we want to. We can decide this is better for me when we want to. We all do. We take opportunities to get ahead. We take opportunities to get in the shortest line, to get in front of somebody in line. We're always looking out for number one, and number one is always us. Synonyms for selfishness are egotistical, self-absorbed. Here's one that's been overused in the last few years, narcissistic. Why do I say it's been overused? Because it's said all the time and it sounds kind of psychological and cool. You know, like I'm a something, something. Yeah, maybe I am. But we'll say, oh, my friend, he's kind of narcissistic. Why don't you just say what that means? He's egotistical. He's inordinately self-absorbed. He's vain. Why don't you use some of the words that you know, your friend doesn't want to be called and you don't want to call him? Because that's what narcissism is. Right. All right? Egotistical, self-absorbed, narcissistic, conceited, vain, undue fascination with self. In our culture, we hear people talk often, I this, I that. I don't like. I wish they'd turn it up. I wish they'd turn it down. I need to take care of me. Marketers know this and openly appeal to our selfishness. You'll be happy when you, ha when you have this. Give yourself a break. You deserve this. You ever heard that on an ad? You deserve this. Treat yourself. We live in such a self-centered culture and self-absorbed culture that it is used all the time in every way, and we embrace it as cool marketing. Cool kids wear this. <sighs> Gotta have. Mark chapter 38. And by the way, we're going to turn to and read in just a minute Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. So turn there, 1035. 
and we'll stand when we read. But let me read this scripture first. Mark 8, 34, when he had called people to himself with his disciples, notice the writer clearly notes that the disciples were among these people. He said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Jesus is saying, take up a cross, and you say, well, does that, does that mean I have a wooden beam that has two cross members and something I can hang on, put one in my backyard, climb up there for an hour every night? And No. Well, does that mean that I die, go jump off a cliff? No. What does it mean? Maybe this will help. The Bible says, I will give myself to him as a living sacrifice. What is a sacrifice, biblically? In the Old Testament, under the Mosaic economy, it was an animal that had to die. So it was a living thing that had to die that was a payment for something in man's liability closet. You, you do certain things that were wrong, you had to bring a sacrifice. Sacrifice was an animal, something alive, something with blood, Blood had to be shed as a remission for sin. For while, here's a scripture, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You can't just say you're sorry. Payment has to be made. So in the New Testament, when it says, I will give myself to him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, it means apparently a person who lives as a sacrifice. Pick up your cross. What's that? Generally speaking, it means crossing your will. <laughs> when Jesus said at the, the night before the cross, when he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done, I don't think it was the first time he'd ever prayed that. It's the first time the prayer is recorded in the Bible, but he had to pray it probably a thousand times before that particular night so that he could do it. It was a habit. It was a practice. He said throughout his ministry, I only do what the Father does. Uh, the Father goes before me, and what, he, what I see him do, then I walk and do. I, I am comp he as much as said, I am completely, totally, and only directed by my Father's will. The psalmist said, speaking of Jesus, when it said, a body you have sacrificed and offering you did not require, a body you have created for me. In the volume of the book it is written, lo, I come to do your will. I delight to do your will. When have we really nurtured our thinking in the delight of living sacrificially or dying to ourself to live unto God? When have we prayed in the morning, Lord, knowing that the Bible says unless a wheat falls to the ground and dies a grain of wheat, it abides alone. But if it dies, it raises up to much fruitfulness. So you guys all know what a seed is. Tiny, little, hard thing, hardly see it, hardly noticeable. No glory to a seed. But oh, what that seed can produce. How? Only after it is buried and dies and begins to decay. And out of that springs life. It's called the life of the seed. Well, seed bear in Jesus' name. Nope. Doesn't work that way. I'm going to be great. <laughs> doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't, doesn't quite work that way, my friends. No, uh, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If you decide to save your life, if you want to save the seed of potential God gave you, you will lose that potential. All you'll end up with is, with is a car, hard, cold seed. But if you give your life, lose your life. Notice he doesn't say die. We think die, but he's not talking about figurative death. Okay, I'm just going to go jump off of bluffs into the Snake River so I can be fruitful. No, that's, that's foolishness. So what is the Lord saying? 
Well, he's saying we have to lose our self-centeredness, our life, so we can live his life. We have to lose what we want to do so that he can give us what he wants to do. It is this road of sacrifice. Okay, Mark chapter 10 and verse 35. Let's stand and read together. Mark chapter 10 and verse 35, and we're going to read through verse 45. Let's read out loud together. Ready? Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, be baptized in the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, You're able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you. Whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Everybody said amen to the reading of God's word. <clears throat> I want to ask you, what do you think motivated Two, one of which was one of the youngest disciples, two brothers. And the other gospel says their mother brought them. Their mother came and, hey, hey, now's a good time. Ask him, ask him, ask him. Mother looking out for her boys. So look at all of these adults motivated by something that I have been describing. What is it? Selfish ambition, selfishness, narcissism, egotism. All these good Christians or Jewish followers of God, as they were in that day, pre-apostles, these are disciples, part of the 12. And they come and say, Lord, would you just do anything we ask you? He said, uh, what's that? They said, ah, we'd like to be two and three in your glory. He said, well... Then you'll have to walk my path. Can you do that? Sure, not a problem. We'd be glad to heal the sick. We'd be glad to raise the dead. Here's what's interesting. If you scooch up just to the verse before we started. We started in verse 5 or, or verse 35. Guess what the, verse 33 says? It says, the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles and they will mock him and scourge him, spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Then James and John, sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Then Jesus asked them, are you willing to drink my cup? Now the cup was a common picture in both biblical and extra biblical literature of ancient times of something that a person was personal that they partook of you know have you ever gone to a party and and they had cups and they had a pen by it so you can put your name on your cup have they ever asked you to put your name on your plate or your fork or your knife or your spoon or your empty custard pie plate or anything no just cups why because it's personal and it's something that you're supposed to drink out of. It's your lot, your drink, your choice, your name. So cups have always 
represented what I drink. Before there were spoons and forks, people often ate out of bowls, cups, me, partake, it's me, it's what I drink, it's what I want, it's what will nourish and strengthen me, it's what will help form my destiny. Jesus said, are, are you willing to drink my personal, what I'm going to partake of? And they said, sure. It's almost amazing to me that Jesus didn't say, uh, were you guys listening in the last verse? <laughs> you just said, sure, to being spit on, beaten, crucified. You just said, sure to all that. Ah, uh, no, we weren't thinking that. It's amazing to me that, and it's also quite comforting, that we see such demonstration of the naked reality of the human heart. Like, Lord, we're ambitious for fame and glory. Yeah, well, it's not mine to give. It's up to the Father's will. Of course, Jesus did the Father's will, and so he probably knew the Father's will, but he was right in telling them I don't make those appointments, but I'll tell you one thing. You'll never get there unless you walk in these steps. If you want to be two and three in my kingdom, you're going to be right behind me in sacrificial service, in willing to die, lay your life down. And so, you know, to me, these are, these are just amazing and powerful truths of the Bible uh, the first thing, uh, my first point today in my lesson is clearly, as I said earlier, we are all self-centered from birth. We're all self-centered from birth. Again, you know, look at a child. They can be sweet as can be, and the next minute they can be so mad and screaming and grabbing and pulling and, and biting, and, you know, it's like, wow, wow what happened to this little demon? <laughs> and, oh, well, that, that side of them came out. Didn't you know they were born in sin, shaping in iniquity without salvation? They will be that way till they're in prison. It's only the intervention of wisdom and grace and training and, that prevents that. Kids have their way. <laughs> My dad always used to tell me when I would be dropped off when I was a young boy, he'd drop me off at somebody's house watching me and say, be sure and spank him if he's out of line. We don't want him to end up in prison. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Well... <laughs> But I come to know by my parents' teaching and training and sacrifice that there was joy in serving the Lord, but it cost you your natural life. You can't have your cake and eat it too with God. You have to give up your cake and embrace his sacrifice, be plowed in underground, be willing to be humbled and to be a servant and take your place last in line and let him exalt you in due time. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you at the right time. Can I know that time? Nope. Can I choose that time? Nada. Can I be involved in moderating how humble I have to go before there's a time? <laughs> yeah, you can do that. It'll mess everything up, but you can, you can do whatever you want. It's your life. It's your choices. It's your moral choice to decide your destiny. But the teaching and the secret of it all is if you want a grand, glorious destiny, if you want to end as a total awesome success and be an astounding saint of the Most High God, there is simply one path, and it is downward. A lot of people misunderstand this because the laws of the kingdom of God are by and large opposite from the laws of nature and of man. It's just kind of a fact that, uh, you know, we, God's upward, you know, is, it's like when God says go upward, we think go downward. When God says, uh, you know, when, when the Lord is, is, is giving his instruction, we think, I want to live. And he says, okay, die. We think, we want to be great. And he says, fine, no problem in being great. This is the path. Uh, uh, that's the path? Yeah. Well, maybe I don't want to be so great. <laughs> if you want to be great in God's kingdom, Learn to be the servant of all. Wow. We used to sing it and clap. Well, here, here's what I want to 
you to understand. When Jesus said this, this is my second point, Jesus does not eliminate spiritual authority when he said, don't be like the Gentiles. But he simply defined spiritual authority because the scripture is replendent with the reality and need of authority and so is culture. When you think of nations, often you think of president's name. If I say Vladimir Putin, who do you think of as a country? Oh, yeah, well, how about that? If I say Joe Biden, who do you think of as a country? Careful, careful, careful. Okay, all right. You're supposed to say there, American president. You don't have to say America, but you can say American president. Okay, whatever. All right, so, <laughs> yeah, dicey stuff. Okay, we'll just get back on the right track here. <laughs> uh, you know, Jesus' last words to the church were, go teach everyone to obey. Peter, Paul, James, and John were all leaders of the early church who functioned as loving, sacrificial leaders who did things like reprove, rebuke, correct with all long suffering. So Jesus didn't eliminate authority. He defined what true spiritual authority was. And they have to be examples, they have to be godly, they have to be pure, they have to be dedicated, they have to be servants, they have to be sacrificial. That is nothing to do with Gentile leaders. They can be rich, powerful, conceited, abusive, they can be all that and be a a, a leader in the world. So Jesus said, you can't be that kind of a leader and succeed in my kingdom. Doesn't mean there aren't leaders, doesn't mean you can't have authority, it just means that you can't do it that way. So let me ask you another question here. If I ask you today, I said, hey, what is the greatest ministry calling in the Bible? You know, I just talked about Peter and James and John and Paul, and you could talk about Isaiah and David and Moses and Elijah. You, what, what type of ministry would you say describes the greatest leaders of the Bible? Some might say prophet. Some might say apostle. Some might say missionary church planter or king or... Let me tell you what the Bible says. Servant is the highest calling of the Bible. And I'll prove it to you with these scriptures. All the great leaders of the Bible were first servants of God. All of them. Let me give you some examples. Romans 1.1, Paul... An apostle? No, a bond servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. What was his first thing? Servant of the Lord. What was his second thing? Apostle. Who was he ever an apostle? The apostle of the Gentiles, the writer of all of the Pauline epistles and the book of Romans, the pinnacle gospel of the whole New Testament. I mean, I mean, think about it. Paul the apostle, wow, what an apostle he was. It's not what he thought of himself. It's actually an interesting thing that Paul the Apostle had a diminished view of himself. He says about 10 years before he died, he said, I'm the least of all apostles, hardly willing to be, worthy to be called one because I persecuted the church of God. About three years before he died, he said, I'm the least of all saints when he was writing to the Ephesian church. And finally, a year before he died, he wrote in Timothy, I'm the chief of all sinners. Do you see the diminishing self-view Paul had just before his life was sown into history and he became the greatest apostle of the early church? He became the apostle of the Gentiles. You and I know the Lord in our church in church today largely because Paul the apostle walked in his servant call. He himself called himself servant. Philippians 1 1, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Jesus Christ who are in Philippi. James 1 1, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1 1, Simon Peter, a bond servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. What are your aspirations in God? What do you want to do for the Lord? To be used of God, to sing, to preach, to pray, 
to be used of God to show someone the way. What do you want to do with your life? How do you want to be an influence? It all starts with, is underpinned by and founded on true selfless servanthood. It's never about a position. It's never about a title. It's never about people wowing at your prophecy or your song of the Lord or your testimony. None of that. If that happens, it's side benefit. The main thing is I was born to serve the Lord. Made in his likeness, created in his image, I was born to serve the Lord. The highest call. So number one, we're all self-centered by birth. Number two, Jesus does not eliminate spiritual authority. And number three, servanthood or being a servant is the highest call of the Bible. Do we demand recognition or title? Why wasn't I put on the screen today? I've served real faithful as a team lead this year too. Well, good. If you change your attitude, you might be up there next Sunday. But, of course, we don't want to profile that attitude, do we? Say, well, that was really common in my high school. Was it a Christian high school? Oh, maybe that's the reason. Do we demand recognition or title? Is your identity in big wig, name, title, identity, or is it in servant of all? I know when you ask men, what do you do? They say, well, I'm a salesman, or I'm a doctor, or I'm a veterinarian, or I'm a firefighter. I, they always define what they do as who they are. But if your identity as a Christian man is in your work, then it's going to be hard for you to work as a Christian because you're more focused on your work goals and identity than on your spiritual identity in Christ. And if you're going to be the servant of all, that's not the way up the ladder in most work settings. Or is it? Let me give you some wrong concepts about Ministry. Did you know ministry in the Bible is not a noun like it is today? I'm in the ministry. I am a minister. In the Bible, it was a verb. You go minister. It's something you do. What is minister? It was meeting human need. Always. I'm ministering to the sick, I'm ministering to the poor, I'm ministering to the weak, I'm ministering to the infirmed, I'm ministering to... It was going and doing something. It was helping. It was having compassion. It was having wisdom from God. It was, it was always something you did. It was never something you were. It's always something you did. It's an action. Christianity is an action. We don't come to church so we can prove that we are a Christian we walk it out all week long. We be a Christian. We do Christian things. We serve the Lord because we love the Lord. Again, I know I'm preaching to the choir because we have so many great servants in the church. But I just want to sort of brush off the beauty of your foundation of ministry in the house. And may we always be known as a church full of servants of the Lord. Pastor Mark, don't you want a church full of preachers, a church full of evangelists, a church full of church planners and missionaries and teachers and preachers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want all that. But none of that will amount to a pile of beans if they're not true servants of the Most High God. So I want them, before they have any kind of big oopity uppity look at me thing with their giftings, they got to serve. One of the reasons I believe that I'm a pastor today is that years ago, I was asked by my pastor to take over the children's ministry of the church. You know where I was when that call came to me? I was at a key to knowledge seminar put on by Kevin Connor in Eugene, Oregon at Frank DiMaggio's Eugene Christian Fellowship with a bunch of young leaders that were uh, retooling their Bible knowledge to be great missionaries and pastors and leaders around the world. I was in that context, in that setting staying at the assistant pastor's house when a call came in from Portland and I was offered the job of a children's pastor, which I didn't even know what that was. They didn't even have one of those at our church. I was the first one. I knew what children were, obviously, but I didn't know what children... 
I don't know what children's ministry was. My wife called me and she said, hey, honey, how's it going? Good, honey. And I'm just thinking, you know, I'm there with young Bible college guys that I graduated with a few years before, and I'm just thinking about all the great things of God we're going to do. And then I get a call from my wife. She said, hey, Mom and Dad were talking and wondered if we wanted to take over the children's ministry. I said, what's that? She said, well, they want to collect because the church has gotten so big, you know, like the, the, the preschools under the Joneses and the nurseries under Wendell and Jenny and the youth is under Stephen Chelan. They, they just want to kind of put all the stuff of children kind of under one canopy from nursery up to junior high. I said, oh, well, I don't know. What, how, how would I learn how to do that? And she said, mom will help. Here's what I thought. Great. I'm getting offered a job to work with my wife and mother-in-law to do something I've never heard of, I've never had to find. I only had one class in Bible college on, a, on the educational ministry church. I, I will be flying blind without my wife's help and my mother-in-law's. And I hang up the phone and I turn back to my let's go change the world group. <laughs> just think about it. And I, I just prayed and God had, in his wonderful way, worked in my heart. He'd taken me the summer before to youth camp, and I'd kind of gotten a heart for some boys, and I'd ended up being their head teacher in their class and saw how really much influence you could have on fifth and sixth grade boys and thought, wow, even me, I'm just barely out of Bible college, and these kids love Brother Mark, you know. Wow, how cool is that? And then I got the call, and I thought, oh, really? That, that's what I'm going to do for the next few years? I had been already, as I got out of Bible college, I offered youth pastorate jobs in Arizona and different things. You know, I was thinking of, you know, the big world here, not to coming home and taking care of the diaper kids, you know. That wasn't what I, <laughs> not what I was thinking about. Think, I'm just being honest with you, you know, just in the mind of a young person. But I did that. Gave myself for eight years. Dee Dee and I ran the children's ministry of Bible Temple. We had 800 children under our ministry from the ages of nursery to junior high. And we had 400 adult volunteers monthly to run all the church programs of this big church on everything that the church did for children besides a Christian school. We did nothing with the Christian school except use their classrooms. But we did all the Sunday school, all the Wednesday classes, all the Thursday night stuff, all the summer camps and Boy Scouts and everything that had to do with the church's ministry to children except Christian education. Debbie and Phil were in that part of it, not us. Dee Dee and I were the children's ministries. And we formed, we made the children's ministry of Bible Temple. And I had to dig into the Word of God, and I had to pray and seek God, and I had to get His Word in His mind. And I, right away, I found out it wasn't about me becoming the best teacher of boys. It was about me training 400 adult volunteers. Because you can't have good children's ministry, you have good teachers, good uh, people. And I found out this interesting fact. You either have to have great curriculum and mediocre teachers, or great teachers and mediocre curriculum. Because a great teacher can take the Bible and make a good kid's class out of it. And so anyway, we, we are always, uh, you know, in a sense, as they say, rolling that dice and trying to get the best curriculum, trying to train teachers. And in the process, God gave me some of the life lessons that I still live by and preach and teach today. And one of them is this. Adults will shine you on and act interested when they're asleep. Kids won't. They won't do that at all. Now they look right at you and say, you're boring. <laughs> or can we leave now? I mean, a kid is so blatantly honest, it's painful. <laughs> and I love that. It's like you got to stay after it and have a good lesson and really pray through and be ready to go or these kids are going to nail you to the wall. <laughs> You're going to be going, get me out of here. <laughs> I didn't know that a few years later that I would be told by the leadership of that church that I was as prepared to go out and be a pastor. The pastor at the time looked at Dee Dee and I, and it wasn't her dad. It was the guy that would take over, and he said, you and Dee Dee are as prepared to be pastors as anybody we've ever sent out of here. And one of the scriptures that God made real to me was out of the life of David, where it says in the Psalms, God took him from the sheepfolds and following the ewes that lambs and made him the shepherd of Israel. And he guided them with the integrity of his heart and the skillfulness of his hands. Where did he learn that? Working in the obscure. You don't need him. He's out there with the sheep, you know. 
just in that who cares, just don't let the wolf get any ministry. Sometimes the most common channels of being asked or recruited into a ministry in a church is the absolute will of God to help you find yourself and serve God as his servant. And I've always been amazed at how people just enter in. And it just amazes me. You know, we'll, uh, we'll have, you know, when we have prayer meetings and we have people sharing and we offer, hey, if you have something from the Lord, did you know that the people who serve obscurely in our church are as full of the word of the Lord as anybody who serves on this platform on Sunday? We have prayer meetings. Who, who, who's up here? All the children's workers. They're all getting words from God from their stories. It's like, wow. You want, to, you want to get good at, at giving exhortations on the Saturday night? Maybe you ought to go teach a lesson in children's ministry. You, see, well, you say, well, wait a minute. I, th- I wanted to be a worshiper. I want to get up and prophesy. I want to preach. I want to, I'll take next Sunday, Pastor. You, you, here's the reality. You don't have anything to say. No matter how many scriptures you know, if you are not a true servant of God. And true servanthood underpins and supports all other ministry. So, greatness is serving the Lord with servanthood. And I, I just want to encourage you all that it's not about the limelight. It's not about a great name. It's not about seeking personal glory. It's, it's not about having a following or impressing men. It's about love for God. It's about love for man. It's about fulfilling God's will. It's about bringing glory to God. It's about winning the lost. It's about the promise of a reward. Not demanding now the reward of human success. And I'm as bound to it as you are. I have to serve. I have to love. You know, my father-in-law, who was the pastor of a great church and always known to be a humble man, he, he used to, if he saw a young leader coming up, he would intentionally drop paper and walk away and turn around and watch and see if that guy would pick it up. Or if he had his two head in the clouds and would walk over and step on it and not even notice a need in, the, in God's house. And he would do little things like that to check servanthood. One time at the end of his life when he was being honored in the Bible college, he was getting up to speak and they honored him as the founding pastor, the founding president of the Bible college that had touched hundreds of students over 30 years. uh, The head of the church that had a publishing company, the head of the church that had a Christian school for 25 years, the the 44-year pastor of Bible Temple, the man who had wrote, had books, 25 books had gone around the world and preached on every, I mean, they were giving him this just... (laughs) They said, let's give our founding pastor, Brother Dick Iverson, a standing ovation as he comes up. And they really, and the leader was being sincere. And Brother Dick, as he was coming up, he tripped and fell. And as they were all clapping, their clapping praise turned into a gasp. And then he got up and he just said, let's all remember that all the glory goes to Jesus. And all of a sudden they realized he had tripped himself. Why? He didn't want all their praise. Why? He didn't do it for their praise. He did it because he was serving the Lord. He's not after the praise of men. And truth be known, praise is, to to a true servant of the Lord, praise is not desirable. Praise feels awkward. It's like, you know, without God, I could have never done that. Why don't you praise him? To a person who loves praise and wants everybody to clap, that's a dangerous sign of self-absorption. Stand to your feet. I want to close with just a a final story. I'm just closing with a final story of how serving touches the world. If we want to be a church that really touches the world, we need to be a serving church with servants everywhere. And honestly, I know we have them. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir. We got lots of great servants. But I just want you to know, if you're new here or been here the last couple of years, if you've come and never found a place of service, 
You need to find a place of service. This isn't a sitting and soaking kind of a church. It's a we're here to serve church. And servanthood actually underpins all of successful businesses, all of successful nations. If you go anywhere and find anything successful, you will find some dedicated services that make the wheels go around. And if you want to be successful at your job, serve everybody. Serve everybody. Be everywhere, noticing everything. Help everybody. Fill in the slot. Do this, do that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Three bags full. Jump how high? That's what makes you successful. It's against the world. You're not strategizing, cunning, stepping on other people to get up. No, 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 no. That's the way of the world. No true servanthood. God will lift you up. I close with this story. Admittedly, we look like a odd group of people. It isn't every day that someone offers to clean the restrooms of the retail carpet store for free. I'm used to surprised people when I ask to when I walk into their business wearing yellow gloves and carrying a toilet cleaning kit. But even I was taken back by the response of the store manager this day. I said, we're Christians who would like to clean your toilets to show you God's love in practical ways. Stunned, the lady looked at me in a high-pitched voice. She said, you're what? As Christians, we believe it's better to give than to receive, and we would rather serve than be served. We'd like to serve you by cleaning. She overreacted, I think, in her response. She said, you know, I've had a good mind to call the cops on you. Why don't you just get out of my store right now? In spite of her harsh answer, I couldn't help but smile a bit as I imagined being handcuffed with my yellow gloves and being hauled to jail for cleaning without a license. (laughs) Something in her tone led me to believe that God was moving in her and in her heart, so I wasn't surprised when she fired back a moment later, well, if it makes you feel good, go ahead and clean our toilets. If it makes you feel good to clean our toilets, then go for it. So we made quick work of the restrooms, and I stopped by on the way out the door, just let her know that we were done. I didn't expect her to thank us, but I was surprised when she snapped, before you leave, I want to talk to you. As I sat waiting for her to finish with a customer feeling like an errant child awaiting discipline from a school principal, she sat down, and I could see in her face that she had experienced above average levels of pain in life. And then she said, you guys are from that church down the street, aren't you? By her tone, I suspected we had still done something to offend her. So I said, yes, that's us. Did we do something wrong? Suddenly she did an attitudinal about face from anger to openness. And she said, you know, I'm only 29 years old, but I've managed to already mess my life up. I've been addicted to alcohol and cocaine. I've had a child, though I've never been married. I'm in a dead-end job. My life seems shattered like a big bag of broken glass. As you were cleaning our toilets, a question popped into my mind. Would an addicted, messed-up person like me fit in at your church? We can all clean a toilet. We can all put on yellow gloves. We can all reach out. We can all serve our neighbors, serve our spouse, serve our children. We we can all do. There's no rocket scientist. The only key here is, are you willing? It's the only key. Are you willing to serve? It's the foundation for success in the kingdom of God. The way up is down. The road higher is lower. You want to live? You got to die to yourself. God is the one who put the reaping, sowing thing in motion. And he says, if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to that spirit, you will of that spirit reap everlasting life. Come on, how many want to be true servants of the Lord? We've got all kinds of serving ministries around, in the church, out of the church, things to do. We're always coming up with stuff going on, and you can serve. You can be a true servant. We give you ministries to do, not because we need help doing our thing, but you need help getting over you. You need help 
getting past the reticence and the, uh, the sitter soaker thing in you that just wants to do nothing but get, get, give, 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 grab, grab, grab. Listen, that position will make you miserable, discontent. You'll be miserable in every church you go to. You'll never be a happy person. It's only when you forget about yourself and concentrate on him and serve him because you love him. And then your life will blossom into life. How many want to be true servants of the Lord? Can I see your hand? This is only possible if you start with believing the gospel. You have to believe that Jesus died for your sin. You have to be born again. You cannot just be a religious person. Christianity is not the same as all the other isms of the world. It has this unique gospel-centric message. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. He's the Prince of life, and He's offered salvation to all who will believe Him. And if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that He was the Son of God, that He came for your sin, He paid the total price, and He is now the ascended Savior and Lord of all, and God has exalted the, the suffering servant of Jesus to the Prince of life in heaven, and He's coming again for His church and you need to be a part of that. If you want to be a part of the happy throng, if you want to be a part of the joy of serving, then give your heart to the Lord today. So we're closing our service today. And if you need Jesus, give your heart to him. And if you need to get over your selfishness, decide today, I'm going to be a servant. And if you have a besetting sin you can't get past, commit today that the next time you feel tempted, you're going to call, you're going to move, you're going to run across the street and mow the neighbor's yard. You're going to do anything to forget about yourself by the sin of serving others so you can be free by overcoming evil with good. Come on, God's given you the simple key. Let's live in it. Let's walk it. Let's be a serving church. God bless you as we close. Come forward if you need prayer. You are worthy of it all. deserve the glory you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory serve it all. this morning. These altars are open. If you need prayer for any reason, please come forward. We'd love to pray with you. He is worthy of it all. Amen. Let's live our lives that way today. You are dismissed. You are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all.
to 